we return once more to a consideration of the words that are to be found in the Gospel of John in the first chapter and verses 12 and 13. Verses 12 and 13 in the first chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of men, but of God. Now, uh, we are looking at this uh, great statement here made in the prologue of John's Gospel because the teaching of the Apostle is that unless we realize these great truths that he is going to unfold in his Gospel, that we shall not be enjoying the benefits of the Christian life nor functioning truly as Christians. So he writes his Gospel in order to enable us to enter more fully into our heritage, the heritage which has been purchased for us by the Son of God who has come into this world. So, you see, in this prologue, he blends together the essence of the great salvation with the way in which it has been made possible to us. And here he holds before us what is, of course, the most wonderful thing about our salvation, and that is that we are made the children of God. We must never think of our salvation merely and only in terms of forgiveness and the possibility of escaping hell. Thank God for that. But that's the negative side of it all. The positive is what we are facing here, that uh, he has given unto us the authority, the right, the privilege to become the children of God. Well, now, having considered how we become the children of God, we are now in process of examining ourselves to make quite sure that we are the children of God. These things are not mere theoretical truths. They're not merely matters of interest. God deliver us from any mere intellectual, mechanical study or division of the Scripture. It can be quite useless. It can puff us up with a kind of head knowledge, but it will be of no avail to us in our personal experiences and in our daily life and living. So it's no use going on with these things until we're all quite certain that we are children of God, that we have this privilege, that we understand what it means when it tells us that he has given us this power, this right to become the children of God. So we began last Sunday morning an examination of ourselves in terms of this great and glorious statement. And we are taking it along the lines of the human analogy. We have seen the first thing we have to test ourselves about is our relationship to the Son, because it is he who gives us this right. There were those who didn't receive him when he came into this world and who still don't receive him. Well, they're not the children of God. You can't be a child of God unless you believe on the name of the only begotten Son of God. Very well, we've considered that, and then we've come on to consider our relationship to the Father. Now, last Sunday morning, we spent our time mainly in looking at this from the subjective standpoint, from the standpoint of the personal relationship and our consciousness of this personal relationship, our feelings our love to him and so on, our pride in our position, our desire to know him and things of that kind and our feeling of respect with regard to him. But now we must go on. We haven't finished. We start with that because that is, of course, the first thing that characterizes this relationship of a father and children. But there are other tests and uh, they're equally valuable. Indeed, they're very vital because... There is always the danger of our deluding ourselves, so the larger the number of tests which we have and which we can apply to ourselves, the better for us and the safer will our position be. So now we go on to draw out certain consequences which are quite inevitable as the result of our realization, our realization of the fact that we are the children of God. 
Now, these, I say, have a more practical nature. Here's one, for instance, which will become the eighth in our uh, series of tests. We produced seven uh, tests last Sunday, so I go on now to the eighth. And it is this. The child always has an interest in the affairs and in the things of the parent. That, again, is quite inevitable. It follows, as I say, by a logical inevitability uh, from the things uh, we were considering uh, last Sunday morning. If we are proud of the relationship and proud of the father, well, we will be interested in his things, in his affairs. We all know how true this is. And it's equally true in this uh, spiritual realm with which uh, we are dealing at this present time. So that there are certain practical tests which we can apply to ourselves in this way. For instance, are we concerned about the name of God and that his name may be made glorious? The human analogy puts this before us at once, I say quite inevitably. We know how nations are proud of their name. We are having evidence of that in this world at the present time. The glory of a country the glory of the name of a country. We want this name to be made glorious, and we in this country have known a great deal about this in past centuries, whatever may be the position and the truth at the present time. Well, this is equally true of families. People are very proud of the name, the family name, and there's nothing that they're not prepared to do for the glory of this name that is upon them, the name of the parent, the name of the founder, of a family or of a dynasty, or something like that. And, of course, uh, the Bible makes it very plain and clear to us that uh, this is always a characteristic also of the child of God. You get it in the Old Testament as well as in the New. Take a book like the Lamentations of Jeremiah. How upset he was. What was he upset about? Well, not about himself, not about his own personal position. What really upset Jeremiah was that God's name was being blasphemed. The failure of Israel was in and of itself something that grieved him, but what grieved him above everything else was that God's name had been lowered before the nations of the world, and so he wept. He describes his feelings in that most intimate manner and yet most powerful, dramatic manner. His eyes were running with tears, he tells us. His heart was melted and broken. Thus describes, as the ancients did, his various feelings in terms of the various organs of the body. But the point is that he was in this position and in this condition of lamenting and in almost inconsolable grief because that God's name had been besmirched and brought down and lowered. And you get that, of course, in the psalmist constantly. He expresses this same thing, and in many, many other places. Very well, then, I say this is a very good test for us to apply to ourselves at the present time. Are we aware of this feeling of grief as we see God's name being blasphemed and reviled? as we read and hear and listen to it all at the present time. Does it grieve us? Does it hurt us? It's a very good test, then. The Christian is not amused by blasphemy. The Christian doesn't think that that sort of thing is clever. He hates it. He hates it because it's being done with respect to God's most holy name. He grieves. He can't help himself. So it's a very good test. How do we feel about all this? Are we uh, aware that this is something that belongs to us, that this is something personal? Very well, let's go on from that and work it out like this. Do we see that the world, the whole of creation, is God's and belongs to God? And do we enjoy everything that is in the world and in creation in those terms and in that way? What's our view of the world? What's our view of the whole cosmos? You see, the child of God sees it as the work of God's fingers. 
God's handiwork. All has been created by God. All has been made by God. And all still belongs to God. So that the Christian, when he looks out upon the world, uh, well, he looks upon it as God's work, as God's glorious creation, God's handiwork. That's how it strikes him. That's how it appeals to him. And as he looks at the human race and the whole of history and everything that's ever happened in this world, he sees it all in terms of God. So that as he looks out upon the human race at the present time, he looks out upon it in terms of God. It is God who made men and not men himself. So that as man is at the moment, it is, a, as it were, a reflection upon the being and the glory and the majesty of God. Well, now all these become tests as we apply them to ourselves. What's our view of the creation? Are we content to adopt scientific theories that would explain it all apart from God, which exclude God? Do we believe it's all the manifestation of some brute force, some inanimate force or power? Or do we, do we see it all as something that God has brought into being? The Christian, the child, sees this as God's estate, God's property. And he delights in it and he glories in it and he's interested in it. He doesn't live for himself. He doesn't live a selfish life. But he's concerned about all this because it is something that his father has brought into being and sustains and something which belongs to his father. Well, then that makes me hurry on to something which is still more urgently relevant. The thing, of course, that marks out the Christian in a peculiar manner is that he is aware that God has got a purpose with respect to this world. And to me, this, at a time like this, becomes perhaps one of the most wonderful and delicate tests of all. An awareness of God's purpose with respect to mankind and with respect to the whole world. Now, this is something, of course, that uh, only the Christian can know. Nobody else believes in it. Even a man who may say that he believes in God. If he hasn't got this peculiar Christian view, if he doesn't believe the truth concerning the Son of God, if he isn't regenerate, born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of men, but of God. He doesn't know this, and he doesn't understand it. And uh, there are many, it seems to me also, who are even in the faith, who are born again, but who have very little knowledge of this purpose of God. Now, the human analogy will help us to see this quite clearly. The infant, the newborn infant, is, of course, a child of the parents, as much as an adult grown man is a child of his parents. But the infant doesn't have much understanding, doesn't know, isn't able to think as of the affairs of the parent in the way that we are now indicating. But it is a sign of growth and development that this becomes something that increases as we go on. And therefore, I'm applying it as a test this morning. The Christian, and especially the mature Christian, is aware that God has got a great purpose with respect to this world. And he's concerned about that purpose. He knows that he's a Christian because of God's purpose. He knows that God having made men and men having fallen, that God then introduced his great plan and purpose of redemption and of salvation. And he can see this being unfolded in the story of the Scriptures. He watches the history and the history that is of real interest to the child of God is not secular history. That's only interesting as it impinges upon and illustrates this other history, which is the history of redemption, the history of salvation, the unfolding purpose of God going on throughout the ages in spite of all opposition and leading to something glorious which is yet to come. Now then, the child obviously is tremendously interested in this purpose. He can't help it. The human analogy, I say, speaks for itself. When a father has some great plan or purpose, he takes the child into his confidence. He knows the child will be interested, will want to know about it. And so he tells him about it. It's a sort of secret. It's not told to everybody. 
It's a secret kept within the family. A plan, a purpose is being put into operation and there's something wonderful going to happen at the end of it. Now the child is let into the secret. Well, that's exactly how the New Testament puts it. He talks, you see, about the mystery of God. And the mystery of God is this great plan and purpose of redemption. Now, it's a mystery because it is something that is hidden from the world. The apostle puts this perfectly in 1 Corinthians 2. He says, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of men the things which God hath prepared for them that love him, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. Now there is this wonderful thing. The secret has been revealed unto us who are children. The world is not aware of it. The world this morning is not at all aware of God's secret purpose, his great plan of recreating the whole cosmos, restoring it to what it was and even something more wonderful than that, peopling it with his own children. That's the purpose. And here it is being unfolded. Now the child has had an insight. He knows this and he's watching it with anxiety. He's concerned about it. In other words, uh, this is the history that to him is thrilling. That doesn't mean that he's not interested in the other history. It doesn't mean that he doesn't read a newspaper. But it does mean that he's not bound by his newspaper. It doesn't mean that his hopes are fixed on what the statesmen are doing. He knows that things may be better for a while and then get worse. It's always been like that. The history of civilization is just an up and down. And in the end, there's no real advance. Back and forth, there it is. But the Christian is not surprised at that. Neither is he depressed by that. Neither does he feel that it's all becoming utterly hopeless and that there is no hope at all. No, no. He sees this purpose above it all, working in, in it, through it, influencing it, but there it is. It's independent. It's this other history, God's history, God's purpose and plan. And, of course, being the child and being let into the mystic secret, he's not only fascinated by this, but he's tremendously concerned about it. Now then, all I'm asking is this. Is this something that is thrilling you? Are you children of God? Well, if you're children of God, well, you must be very concerned about this great purpose of God. Let me divide it up a little. This great teaching in the Bible about the kingdom of God. Our Lord's preaching was mainly about this kingdom of God. It had been spoken of in the Old Testament. The prophets were concerned about this. Our Lord preaches. The apostles preach about this kingdom of God that has come, that is coming, is yet to come, and so on. Or to put it still more simply, let me put it in terms of the church. For the church is the present form of the kingdom of God. All of us who are children of God are citizens of God's kingdom. The terms are used interchangeably. Our citizenship is in heaven, says the Apostle Paul to the Philippians. Of course, quite right. We have been made fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. The two things are true. <coughs> we are children of God, but we are also citizens of God's kingdom. And we are members of the church, which is the body of Christ, the present form of the kingdom of God. Well, now then, the church is the church of the living God. So that we can put this test to ourselves in a very simple and practical way by putting it like this. <coughs> are we at all concerned about God's church and God's kingdom? Are we concerned about the state of the church? I don't know a better test of sonship at the present time than just this. Here is God's community, God's people. This kingdom of God is here in this form at the moment. Not a visible one, but in this form. And therefore I say that there is no more sure or certain test of our whole relationship than our interest in and our concern about the church of God. 
Well, you see how this works itself out. It's a test not only of the relationship, but it's a test of our growth within the relationship. The child, as I say, soon begins to develop a certain interest in the affairs of the father and of the family. But, of course, as he gets older, the concern becomes very much greater and very much deeper. While still very young, the child is mostly concerned, of course, about himself and his own pleasures and happiness and the benefits that he gets from the relationship. There's nothing wrong in that. That's perfectly natural. You don't expect an old head on young shoulders, as we put it, and it's quite right. It'd be very wrong uh, to expect the opposite. But now, here is the point I say, as you grow and develop, well, you think less and less about yourself and the benefits which you get, and you're more and more concerned about the name, the honor, the glory, and the success of God's interests and God's affairs. So it's a very good test of our whole position this morning, as to the depth of our concern about the Christian church. What is our attitude to the church? What's our attitude to even coming here and to our services? Is this a place from, to which you come just to get something? Or are you interested? Interested, I say, in God's kingdom coming. The success of God's kingdom. In other words, does it grieve us to see the church of God as she is at the present time, derided by men, scorned by men, ridiculed, blasphemed? It's happening around us rampantly at the present time. Now, my question is, does that concern us? We are in a superior position to Jeremiah. Jeremiah only looked forward to the coming of Christ, only looked forward to the all these glories, he saw them all in a very distant manner. You and I are looking back upon them. They've happened, he's been, he has come. And the Spirit has been poured out in profusion. Therefore, I say, if Jeremiah wept and shed tears and was unhappy and was ill even because he saw God's kingdom down, as it were, Jerusalem reduced to a heap of ruins and sacked by the enemy and the object of ridicule on behalf of the people. It grieved this man. He was utterly cast down by it and he writes his lamentation. Are we grieved about the state of the Christian church? How often do we think about it? How often are we disturbed by this? How often have we wept for the church? How often have we prayed for the church? How often have we prayed for the success of the church because she is the kingdom of God? How often have we asked for God uh, to arise and to pour his blessing upon us? No, there's no need for me to press the analogy. A child worthy of the name becomes deeply concerned if he sees his father's affairs going into a kind of decline. He's anxious, he's disturbed, he's unhappy. He wonders if he can do something. It's the inevitable reaction. And it should be still more so with the child of God. He must be concerned about the success of God's kingdom, about the extension of God's kingdom. He must be interested in every enterprise, therefore, that is calculated to extend the confines of this kingdom, to make it known, to make the gospel known. Well, I needn't keep you with these things but it's a very good test always of the Christian. This is concern about the church, is concern about the missionary enterprise of the church, the expansion of the church, the spreading of the good news of salvation. Now, my dear friends, what hope is there until you and I are clear about these things? Now, it's all a part of our sonship. The danger always is, isn't it, that we're interested in the benefits of Christianity, benefits of salvation. Yes, but they're benefits that are given to children. And it is only as we really function as children that we have a right to expect these special blessings. It's no use saying I'm a child of God unless you're giving some evidence of it. And I know no better evidence at the present time than a real grief because of the state of the Christian church and a yearning and a pleading with God and a longing for revival, a longing to see the old estate which is almost in ruins rehabilitated set upon its feet again, made mighty and strong and powerful. Are we aware of such a desire? How easy it is to take a theoretical view of sonship. 
But you see, sonship is something which is real. And then I say finally under this heading that the child, of course, always looks forward with longing to that final triumph, that final consummation. If we really know anything about the purpose of God, oh, we know that there is a glorious day coming. The whole Bible is pointing to it, looking forward to it. God's plan, God's purpose, God's kingdom will finally come in a visible, external manner and Christ shall reign from shore to shore and from pole to pole. It's a glorious day. God will be over all. God will be all and in all. The glory that is coming. Now, you can't be a child of God and be indifferent to these things. You can't be a child of God and not be interested in that. The thing is unnatural. Yet at any rate, it's a very poor child that is simply interested in present enjoyments and hasn't this great interest in and concern about the whole, the plan, the purpose, the affairs of the Father. Well, let me give you the final word about this. You remember our Lord at the age of 12. He'd been taken up to Jerusalem by his mother Mary and by Joseph. And there they'd been, and they were on their way back, and suddenly they found that he was missing. And they couldn't find him. And they went back to Jerusalem, and they found him there in the temple, reasoning and arguing and confuting the doctors of the law and so on. And they reprimanded him for not having gone with them. And his reply was this, Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? Which means this, Wist ye not that I must be about the things of my father? And that's his heavenly father. He was concerned about the things of the kingdom. He was reasoning and arguing about them at the age of 12. He's got this great concern about the things of my father. And we as the children of God, by adoption and by this new birth, inevitably must have the same interest and the same concern. Wist he not that I must be about the things of my father? Now, my dear friends, to what extent are you concerned about the things of your Heavenly Father? How often do you think about them? Do you only think about them on Sunday, or do you think about them every day? Do you meditate about these things? Do you pray about these things? Do you read the Bible in order to have a greater understanding of these things? These questions, I say, are important not merely from the standpoint of our own enjoyment You'll be judged in eternity by this. Can there be anything more terrible for a child than to arrive in the glory and find that the whole time he'd never grown, he was just a selfish little child, almost an infant, thinking only of himself and his own pleasures and his own interests, and had never shown any concern about the things, the affairs of his father? It's a very deep test, this, of our whole relationship to God as his children. Do we honestly sing that, that hymn? Thy kingdom come, O Christ. Thy kingdom come, O God. Thy rule, O Christ, begin. As you live in this evil world and see the blasphemy, I say, and the godlessness and all the arrogance of evil round and about you, don't you sometimes say, Oh, that he would come and end it all and destroy his enemies and set up his glorious kingdom of light and truth and beauty and joy and holiness. Oh, do we know something about this longing? Do we understand John as he ends the book of Revelation and says, Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The Christian, is is not merely disgusted at the evil that is rampant about him at a time like this. He longs for this great day that is to come, for it is to come. And it will come. And the child is one who is filled with anticipations of glory because he knows that his father is going to be over all and all his enemies shall be consigned to a final perdition. He must rejoice in the thought of it. He must look forward to it with eager anticipation. Very well. There is a test then in terms of our interest in the affairs of the father. The next test we go on to the ninth, and all these things are linked with one another, of course, it is this, the desire to please him. 
And here again is something that grows as we all grow. The desire to please increases as the child grows and develops. That is the mark, isn't it, of growth from pure self-centeredness and selfishness and the desire to have things and to have things done to us to a concern about others. The realization of benefits received immediately leads to this desire to thank and we show that by pleasing. And that, of course, in terms of our relationship to God becomes a question of uh, keeping his commandments. Now, I indicated last Sunday morning that there is no better exposition of this whole subject Then the first epistle of John. There you've got these tests of this relationship to God stated and brought together in a most wonderful manner. They are the tests of life. They are the tests of whether we are truly the children of God or not. And John has got much to say about this very thing. And he tells us here there in that fifth chapter of that first epistle in the third verse. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. Then he goes on. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Now the point here is, of course, and the thing that he's emphasizing Is that to the child, the commandments of God are not grievous. In other words, he rejoices them. He likes them. He truly is joyful in them and in the performance of them. And here again is a very deep and very subtle test of our whole position this morning. There are people who admire the commandments of God. They recognize that they're good social enactments. I've heard men before now describing Moses as the first minister of health. That's their view of the laws of Moses. There's a great deal of truth in that. They're very wonderful, looked at even from that standpoint. There are people who admire the morality and the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount and so on. They say it's very good for society, and they'd like to impose that upon society. But that isn't the attitude of the child of God. All this to the natural men is grievous. It's a burden to be born. It's something that is against the grain. He doesn't like it. He feels it's always prohibitive and restricting and restraining. It's a collection of vetoes, he says. But according to the teaching here, the child, the characteristic of the child is that these things are not grievous to him. Why? Well, because he's got that nature in him. He has the same nature in him. He's born again. He's got a new disposition. He is seeing everything in an entirely new way and manner. Now, this is not to him any longer a matter of duty. It's a matter now of pleasing his father. I needn't keep you with this. I think the analogy points it so perfectly. The moment you realize the relationship and the element of love comes in, duty goes out through the door. You can be very correct in a matter of duty, but that's very different from love. You don't force yourself to do things when love is in control. You delight in doing them. You wish you had more to do, and you're anxious to do them. Now, that's the whole relationship of the child to the commandments of God. Oh, I can sum it up very easily. Do you still feel that Christianity is rather narrow? If you do, you're not a child of God. It is inconceivable that a child of God should regard all this as narrow. Because he's a child, he must hate sin. He receives sin now as that which entered into God's perfect universe and brought all this calamity upon us. He sees it as rebellion. He sees it as hatred of God. And therefore he must hate it. Ye that love the Lord, hate evil, says the psalmist. And it's a wonderful bit of logic that it follows. If you do love the Lord, well, you must hate evil. And the child of God does hate evil. Oh, if you still feel that, well, it's probably the right and the best thing to be a Christian, it's probably right to go to church on a Sunday morning, if that's your attitude, 
And uh, you really wish sometimes that you hadn't ever heard of it, but there it is. You're afraid not to do it, and you're hoping it's somehow going to help you. If that's your attitude, my dear friend, it's almost the opposite of the condition of a child. You're being forced by a fear, by some kind of law and legalism. That's not Christianity. Christianity is that which says with the psalmist, Oh, how love I thy law. There's nothing grievous to the Christian about the commandments of God. He sees they're absolutely right. They're essentially right. They're a reflection of God himself, and he wants to be like God. So they're not grievous. He doesn't have to lash himself to doing it. He doesn't feel he's making a great sacrifice. A Christian who feels that he's making a sacrifice by worshipping God or coming to his house or reading his Bible or living the Christian life is not a Christian at all. He's deluding himself. He's fooling himself. He's got a bit of morality, which he's talking about in Christian terms. That's not Christianity. There's a liberty. There's an abandon. There's a love. There's a rejoicing. There's nothing grievous here. Do you enjoy worshipping God, my friend? Do you enjoy doing everything you can to please God? Is it your supreme delight to hear his dictates and obey? That's the test. And these are tests of a childlike relationship. You see, God is no longer just the stern lawgiver to the Christian. He's become his father, who's loved him with an everlasting love, sent his only begotten son into the world to die for him and to make him a child and to adopt him in this way. He's no longer, I say, just a stern lawgiver. Well, John has put it all for us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? Then he puts it like this. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. What is our attitude, therefore, and our relationship to the commandments of God at this moment. Are we striving to keep them because we're afraid of what will happen to us if we don't? Is that it? Oh, my dear friends, that's that craven fear, the fear that hath torment. That's not reverence and godly fear. That's the fear that hath torment which perfect love casts out. I'll put it all in a question. Are you enjoying your Christianity? Are you enjoying your Christian living? Are you enjoying your strivings after holiness? These are inevitable in the child who is anxious to please the father and to promote his interest. But let me put the negative side of that as my tenth test. And John does this again in his first epistle. The Christian not finding the commandments of God grievous is therefore one, as he puts it, who does not continue in sin. Now, here is very profound teaching. Listen to what John says about this. He says it in the first chapter, in the sixth verse. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. We are told today that people like plain speaking. They don't like sloppy sentiment. We like plain speaking. Well, here it is. If we say that we have fellowship with him who has already been described as light, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness in the meantime, well, there's only one thing to say about us. We lie. And do not the truth. Now, you can't mix these things. You can't mix light and darkness. You can't mix God and Belial. And if you say that you are a believer in Christ and that you're a child of God and that you're rejoicing in it, but your life is still that old life of darkness, there's only one thing to say about you. Not only are you not a Christian, but you're a terrible liar. Well, all right, I've anticipated the way in which he puts it. In the second chapter, in verse 4, you notice how these men go on repeating these things. They know us so well. It isn't enough to tell us a thing once. We'll soon forget it, so it's repeated. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. 
He doesn't need any demonstration. It's an absolute necessity. The thing is impossible together with the other. So a man who makes a claim like this, I know him, I'm a Christian, I'm changed, I'm different, I'm born of God. And if at the same time you're not keeping his commandments, well, you're just a bare-faced liar. And there's nothing else to say about you. There's no truth in you at all. That's an essential lie. You see, the devil's very clever and he persuades people sometimes that they're Christians. He can give you a bogus experience. He can create feelings within you. He can make you say the right things. But the test is, are you born again? Have you got a new nature? Have you got a new disposition? Are you like the Father? Do you love the Father? Are you concerned about the Father's interests? Is it your supreme delight to please that Father? If it is, you cannot go on walking in darkness. It's impossible. Very well. Again, I've anticipated what he says in the third chapter, in verses 8 to 10. Listen to this. He that committeth sin. But let me introduce it with verse 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. You see, there were false teachers deceiving the early Christians. There have always been people who've got a very nice packet kind of Christianity which gives you everything for nothing and makes no demands upon you at all. It's all very nice and happy and comfortable. Let no man deceive you. There is a false representation of Christianity that has always troubled the church. The shortcuts, the cults are experts at it, of course, and it tends to come into the Christian church. Everything made easy. Let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God, therefore, doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Now then, what does that mean? The man that doeth righteousness, he says, does it because he is righteous, because he's got this righteous nature, even as God is righteous. He that committeth sin, well, he's proving that he's of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. Now he says, God sent his son into the world. Here it is, we are back again, you see, in the prologue of John. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's the great announcement. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. What for? Why did he come? Here's the answer. That he might destroy the works of the devil. Undo them. Get rid of them. Whosoever, therefore, he says, is born of God, does not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's quite obvious, isn't it? That he is not saying that if a man sins at all or at any time, that therefore he's not a Christian. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a single Christian, and there would never have been a Christian. There has never been a man in the world yet who hasn't sinned. He's already told us that in the first chapter in verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Well, what does he mean? Well, you see, what he means is this. The tense of the word used in the original makes it perfectly clear. He says, the Christian is a man who does not go on committing sin. There is this continuous element. When he says, he that committeth sin is of the devil, he that goes on living a life of sin is of the devil. That's what he's saying. Whosoever is born of God does not go on committing sin or living the life of sin. He doesn't lie down in sin. He doesn't live as he formerly did. Before a man becomes a Christian, before a man is born again and born of God, he lives in sin. He is immersed in sin, and he never gets out of it. 
He may, for the time being, be a little bit better than he was, but it doesn't matter. He is living in sin. His feet are in the bog and in the mire. He may extricate himself up to a certain point, but he's still in the bog. He's in sin. He's dwelling in sin. He remains. He abides in sin. But when a man becomes a Christian, he's taken right out of that. He's put into a new realm, into the kingdom of God. Now then, he may fall in that kingdom of God, he may fall into sin. Yes, but it doesn't mean that he goes back into the kingdom of sin. He doesn't lie down in sin. He isn't immersed in sin. That's what he's saying. He doesn't go on in this life of sin as he did before. I remember once trying to put this point by putting it in the form of a picture, a kind of illustration, two graphs. And I think it does help. Imagine two lines... Here's the moral man. Here's his line. That's his basic life, his basic life. Sometimes, as the result of a great effort, or as the result of an illness, or somebody's death, he tries to pull himself together. And instead of continuing on his basic line, he rises a little bit above it for a while, but back he goes again. There he is. His whole life is something like that. A little bit better at times, but back again. The basic life is down here. What of the Christian? Well, his basic line is up there. What's his life? Well, his life is this. There's his basic life. Sometimes he falls. But then he repents, he goes back, and he continues. It's the difference between a low basic line trying to elevate itself and a line that has been elevated by the Son of God that occasionally falls. That's the interpretation of 1 John 3, verses 7 to 10 but it's a very good and a very thorough test. If you want to know whether you're a Christian or just a moral man who's trying to make himself a Christian, here it is. The man who's not a Christian has spasms of being good and trying to be good. The Christian is a man who occasionally does wrong. The whole question is, what is the tenor of our life? What is our basic position? Is your life fundamentally a life of holiness or is it not? That's the question. And these statements here made by the Apostle make the thing abundantly plain and clear to us. Because we are children of God and the seed of God remains in us, he says he cannot go on living that life of sin. He cannot. It's impossible. For his seed remaineth in him, and he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. The Christian simply cannot go on living a sinful, evil life. Now then, let me end by putting it like this. You say, but I've known Christians who have lived at times... A sinful life, I agree. That's what we call a backslider, isn't it? How do you tell the difference between a Christian backsliding and a man who's merely trying to make himself a Christian? Well, here's the essential test. A backslider must come back. He can't continue there. If you tell me you know a man who's been born again and who seemed to be a bright Christian but who lived the remainder of his life after a given point in in sin, unrelieved and in evil, turned his back upon the church, scoffed at the things of God, never came near, and he died like that, I say that man was never a Christian at all. The backslider, however grievously he may fall into sin, he never stays in it. He may stay in it for some time. He never ends his life in it. He never continues in it. He must come out of it. He can't help himself. The backslider is a miserable sinner in this sense, that he doesn't enjoy it as he did. He enjoys it in one sense, but in another he hates it. He's a man in conflict. He's a man in confusion. He hates himself for it. He's miserable even when he's apparently enjoying his sin. The seed remains in him, and it brings him back. It never fails. It must be true of necessity. He is born of God, and the seed of God is in him. And he will come back. He'll be brought back. He cannot abide in a life of sin, whatever may be true of him temporarily. Very well then, my friends, we examine and test ourselves in the light of these things. 
I still haven't finished our tests, but we've got to leave it at that for this present morning. Oh, may God give us grace to examine ourselves. Little children, let no man deceive you. There is nothing more urgent for every one of us at this moment than to know that we are the children of God. Not only because of the present, but because of the fact that we are going to die and because of the fact that the glory of eternity is there ahead of us. Let's make certain. Let's not be content merely with words and with statements or anything superficial. Let's know that we are the children of God beyond any mistake. Let's apply then more and more to ourselves the three tests that we've been looking at together this morning and prepare ourselves for that which is yet to come. Let us join in singing hymn. Number 437, 437. My gracious Lord, I own thy right to every service I can pay and call it my supreme delight to hear thy dictates and obey. 437. keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and ever throughout the remainder of this our short and certain earthly life and pilgrimage and until we shall stand before him in the glory See him as he is, and be made like unto him. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust Audio Library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.